this morning to our Sunday a.m. service. If you can find your seats, sing along, clap your hands, and give God the praise and glory this morning. I lay my life down at your feet, cause you're the only one I need. I turn to you when you're away. In trouble times, in trouble times, it's to you I see. I put you first, that's all I need. All I am called to you Sing one way One way Jesus You're the only one that I could live for One way Jesus You're the only one that I could live for Sing you were always there And you were always, always there Every hour and every Yesterday, today, this Forever to forever Peace, no way See, one way One way Sing, 
worship you this morning. Lord, right now, this morning. fellowshipping on Thursday and we asked a question at fellowship and the question was this what does dominion look like what does dominion look like to you in the Bible there's plenty of great opportunities about dominion there was one of Goliath's head outside the city gates of Jerusalem on a pole and uh, that's dominion amen a young man called David in the book of uh, first Samuel he got dominion over Goliath and he fought him at the battle and defeated him but dominion wasn't just that one battle, it was a lead up, it was a build up, wasn't it? So David, it said in 1 Samuel, he killed a lion and he killed a bear on the lead up. Now in reference to our finances, we can have dominion today. But it's something we've got to practice day in, day out. 
David killed the lion and the bear, and for you and I, we've got to get dominion over our finances, dominion over our spending habits, dominion over stewardship. Are we spending the way God's wanting us to spend? Do we have dominion on Sundays when we come and, and, and tithe? Do we have dominion in the area of giving? Do we have dominion uh, uh, over our family spending? Because when you and I do have dominion over our finances and we do it God's way, uh, it says in Malachi 3.11, God says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that, you will, uh, so that he will not de- destroy the fruit of the ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. Church, tithing is dominion. Stewardship is dominion. Having the ability to give is dominion. Let's keep and gain dominion in this area today. Let's cut the head off the devil in Jesus' name. And let's get Ash to pray over the offering. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I know that 9 a.m., our new revised time, is probably a little bit tricky for some. Uh, You have to get up even earlier now to be here, but you do get a long day before we come back tonight. And so thank you so much for being our great crowd here today at this uh, time of year. In our Bible, Acts chapter 2, if you would like to turn there, and we do put the verses on the screen, so if you don't have a Bible, if you don't know anything about Christianity, you've never been to church before, that's absolutely fine, and we do what we can do uh, to help you be able to uh, be part of this and and comprehend what we're talking about. So Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament in our Bible, and we're going to read in a minute 42 to 47. One of the things about this time of year, about Christmas is a lot of people get together. And even whether you work, it's interesting that I I hear often people, we had our work Christmas lunch or we've got our Christmas party or we've got our Christmas dinner uh, to do with our work. And then, of course, there's family. And it's very interesting that many people, when they think about Christmas, they think about getting together. And even if they have no idea about Christianity and Christ, and we know that's what Christmas is really about, For a lot of people, they'll say, well, you know, Christmas is about getting together with family or it's getting together with friends. But it pinpoints what I want to look at today in our Bible, and that's the subject of fellowship or the fundamentals of that. And that word is a word that you don't use in everyday language. It's not something that regular people use when they're talking at work in the smoko room. But So when I use the word fellowship today... I'm literally and most specifically talking about getting together, eating food. Fellowship without food is not as much fun as fellowship with food. But getting together, and I want to keep this very simple, but getting together and the benefit of this and what this produces. Now, for Christians, obviously, this is centered on the fact that they have a personal relationship with Jesus. If you just look around the building here today, have a look at the diversity that is in this hall. Have a look, it's okay. Yeah, I know they look weird, some of them, don't they? Have a look around. Check it out. Let me tell you, you will not find this anywhere except probably in a Christian church. The diversity of age, the diversity of culture, the diversity of skin colour, the diversity of background, the diversity of languages, the diversity of vocation. We have some people here, they work in offices, the greatest injury they ever get is a paper cut. There's other people here, they drive vehicles. There's other people here, they work on vehicles. There's other people here, they work in hospitals. We have teachers, we have every type of person imaginable and yet think about it, what would bring us together? Why would we be together? Because we are right now even in church in fellowship and this is one of the most powerful elements in Christianity 
And this is something that's why I harp on it so much, I preach on it so much. If you even heard the last two sermons, there were references to this in both of them. But I want to lock right in on this specifically again today. This is one of the strengths of our congregation. It's one that we will continue to strengthen. This is one of the things that I try uh, to make very clear to our pioneer pastors is that one of the, one of the keys to help building a congregation is fellowship. It's relationship. It's food. It's getting together, it's being entertained, it's being around other people. If, if it's all just hard preaching and rules, that, that, that wears thin with people very quickly. And so I want to look at this subject, the fundamentals of fellowship, Acts chapter 2, which is probably the easiest way uh, to examine this biblically, verse 42 to verse 47. And where we're reading is these are predominantly all new Christians. They're young Christians. They're not old, starchy believers. They're not old, tired wineskins that just want to avoid people. But these are people who are relatively, relatively fresh in their faith and they want their relationship with God, but they also want it and they're having it with each other. But I want to highlight these people are also very different from each other. They're different in culture. They're different in background. Many of them had different languages. That meant many of them would have had accents when they spoke in a common language. Acts 2, verse 42 to verse 47. Let me read that and let's have a look at this topic. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which means teaching, and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers, and then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, that would be church, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. One of the things that inspired this message that I want to preach today has been the fellowship after morning prayer. Now, I know that we don't have official morning prayer at a building at the moment because we're not in our own building, but... Uh, at Ben and Leo's house, we've been privileged that we get to pray there if, uh, each morning and we stop at 7 o'clock and have a coffee for anybody that's got time and then we all disappear off to our regular day. But what has so struck me again so often at this fellowship after prayer is just the way that it knits you together. Some, some, some fellowships are okay, some are good, but there's others that they're just incredibly enriching. There's just something about it, about, about being together. And I want to look first of all at forging friendships. See, when you look at the early church, they were a really close-knit group of people. Verse 44 we just read. Now, all who believed were together together and had all things in common. Now, one of the principles, which is a comment on human nature, is the need for companionship. This, 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 is, this, is, this, is, this is in every one of us. This is in our subconscious makeup, uh, is that you and I want relationships with people. This is why in Genesis 2, God said, the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. Now, we know following that is when he made woman, and this is where the first marriage came into play. But the principle there, the principal comment on human nature is every one of us, we need companionship. This is why Proverbs also says, a man who isolates himself rages against all wise judgment. In other words, if I put that in simple terms or layman's terms for you, that's saying that somebody who deliberately separates himself off from other people is a fool. It's foolish. It's a mistake. It's a bad thing. 
because here is the principal way of human nature. We need companionship. And when you look at the book of Acts in our text today, these people obviously had strong, healthy relationships with one another. But this is why we have to remember these binding relationships will be tested. Listen, the devil will make sure of that. There's an old adage of war, and this happens. It can happen in a marriage. It can happen in a home. Divide and conquer. And this is why the enemy is always going to try and find ways to work a wedge between people. This is another reason why God hates brethren who sow division. It's so frustrating, it's so angering over the years when you've had people that were serving God, they belonged to a congregation, a family, they were doing very well. And someone else gets in their ear and starts to separate them off, starts to place a wedge between those people. And this is why in Proverbs 6.16, these things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. When you hear the word abomination, that means God hates it, like he hates homosexuality. He hates it. And then it goes on in Proverbs 6.19 and it says, so six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination. Verse 19 of Proverbs 6, and one who sows discord among brethren. What this is talking about is relationships, they can be severed because someone else slices them apart. Because someone else comes in there, they get in there and they start to say things and they basically, it's like taking a, a sword or, or a large knife or a machete and literally just slices down uh, something in between and now these people are broken in relationship, they're severed, they're brought apart because somebody else caused that. And God says, I absolutely hate that because friendships are so necessary. This is why it's the togetherness that builds and, and it promotes the relationship. And this comes when you learn transparency. John 15, uh, uh, verse 15, but I'm going to read it from the message for you. Jesus said, I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. Now, this is indicative of transparency. Jesus is saying, I'm not keeping any secrets from you, that everything that the Father in heaven has downloaded into me, I'm making it available to you. Now, listen, that is one of the keys to how you forge friendships. It's being transparent. And we know that that's why when someone's doing wrong, many times, what will they do? They will isolate themselves. They will, they will begin to get off on their own. They don't want the transparency. They don't want to avail themselves to transparency. They don't want other people to know what they're up to and what they're doing. And now the person begins to be isolated. But you see, in genuine friendships, friends have an affinity with one another. It's a mutual affection. And affinity, it literally means a natural liking for and understanding of someone. And this is the most extraordinary thing that happens when you fellowship with people. You start to form an, inf an affinity. You start to make a connection. And it's amazing. There can be someone, again, they're a different culture. They're from a different background. They can be a different age. And yet you spend time together and with transparency, there begins to be a bond that is formed. And that is why it is very hard to develop friendships if we're not taking or making time for each other. This is why people say, let's catch up for a coffee. Let's go and train at the gym. Let's go walking together. Let's have lunch together. Let's have dinner together. We all know what it is and you'll know our church life. Any excuse to eat food, we come up with it. And it's such a rewarding thing, not just because it's the food, but it's because of the forming of friendship and friendships take time and the bond pulls tighter with time. We all start from the same place, and that's our sinful past. 
And that's why you can build friendship with any Christian because you all have the same origin. You and I all come from a life of sin. And that's why there's the ability to be able to connect and to get along because we start at the same place and as long as we remember, it's going to take time, it's going to take some effort, some energy. We can build a friendship and Proverbs 18 says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. So here is the first reason why fellowship is so important. It's where you forge friendship. The second one though is that fellowship builds unity. Now, union and unity are different. There can be union without unity. Think about the United States. The United States of America is 50 plus states. And they have the one flag, it's the stars and the stripes, it's in all the movies. But in reality, the United States is an incredibly divided, diverse nation of people. This state doesn't like that state. This state disagrees with that state. So they're united, but being united doesn't mean unity. Now, I want you to hold that thought. See, our congregation must be in unity. And unity is a Latin word, or it comes from the Latin word unitas, U-N-I-T-A-S, and it means one. Now, this is what we have to constantly contend for as a church, is that we're not just united, but rather we are one. In Psalm 133, verse 1, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So church, what that means is it's not enough that we're just together. Our hearts have to be synchronized. We have to be in unity together. Our hearts have to be knit together as one. One of the things that I pray so often for our congregation, especially in pre-service prayer, is God knit our hearts together as one. I remember many years ago, my wife and I talking about marriage and exchanged some thoughts on how we should go about it. And I credit her with all of these great thoughts. And I've been praying them for years now. She said, you know, I pray that we have a like-mindedness. She said, I pray that our hearts are knit together as one. And I've added to that. I pray that you multiply the love you've given to us for each other. But listen, the fact is, is if people are going to be one, if they're going to be together, their hearts, which is their minds, they're interchangeable in Scripture, their hearts must be synchronized. This is how an orchestra works. Here you might have 30, 40 different musicians playing all different instruments, uh, playing all different melodies, uh, coming in, going out at different times. But what you hear with an orchestral uh, piece of music is you hear symphony. What do you hear? They are synchronized. They are playing together. They are unified together. Their hearts are joined together. And this is something that you and I must be very, very careful that we contend for. This is why Jesus addressed disunity. In Matthew chapter 5, 22 to 24, But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come off your gift. See, what Jesus is doing there is he's removing any excuses that you and I might have when we harbor attitudes towards people. He's saying, listen, you you can't be pretend here. You can't be a pseudo-disciple. Don't be a pseudo-pastor. And and these are people who, they say all the things and they quote the cliches and they've got all the gear on. They look the part and they're all very, sound very Christian now they're coming across. But in essence, their heart is filled with all kinds of angst towards people. Sowing division causing problems, 
setting one against another. And Jesus says, listen, don't waste your time bringing your gift to the altar. Who's the gift for? The gift is before God. He says, listen, put it down, leave the gift there and go and fix it up first of all. Then come back because he says, now I'm excited about your gift. Now I want to receive what you want to give me. But while you're at odds with the brother or the sister and you're treating people wrongly, he says, I don't want your gift. Because what I want the most is that you would be in unity with the brethren. I wonder how many people this Christmas have bought gifts for someone who they don't like, they don't want to see them, they got a bad attitude to them, but they still bought the present. That's why I don't do presents, easy. But let's be honest, how many people buy things at Christmas for someone they don't like, and the one they buy it for doesn't like them, but we all do it, or they all do it because that's what you're meant to do. Well, we don't do that here because we're Christian people, praise the Lord. But see, a great church has to be authenticated by the unity. That the genuine, clearly exhibited by undisputed, bona fide coalition of the people. That when you see those people together, it's a coalition of unity uh, and it's enhanced by the effort that they go to uh, at working with one another, at reconciling with one another, at being in coalition together with one another. And Romans 12, 18, it says, if it is possible as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. As much as it depends on you. It doesn't say as much as it depends on them. It says, it's talking to me, it's talking to Peter. It's saying, Peter, as much as it depends on Peter, you live peaceably with all men. See, in the book of Acts, again, these people were different. Have you ever sat with someone from a different culture and watched how they eat and it kind of reminded you that we're different? Even what they're eating sometimes reminds you we're different. But see, that's what unity is. Think about Jesus when he was born. The group gathered around. You have the young family, Joseph and Mary. They've got the newborn baby. There's also the shepherds. These were poor, uneducated country people. And then you had the kings of the east. Very rich, very wealthy, carried a lot of authority and influence, and here they all were gathered together in unity because that's what Jesus Christ does. He unifies people. In our text, it says, All who believed were together, and they continued daily with one accord. Verse 46 breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food. Do you know what that means? They fellowshiped. It's that simple. That these people now got together, they began to mix. There was an interchange of relationship and food and conversation. They began to embrace each other's children. They began to have a transparent, genuine relationship with one another. They mixed, they mingled, and they spent time together. And that is how... You build unity. Let's look then finally at building the church. Now we are guaranteed that his church is going to be built. I was messing around with Pastor Reeves in a text yesterday and talking about a service that he needs myself and Pastor Dax to cover and he mentioned that the one that I'd be there that he said, oh, but I won't be there. So I texted him back and I said, listen, Jesus' church is fine without the pastor. It's his church and he'll build it and it'll be just fine. It doesn't really need us. It's his church. He's going to build his church. Are you with me? And, and this is a wonderful scripture. If you're ever going to pioneer, hang on to this scripture. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus is talking to Peter. He says, I see that you're Peter on this rock. And that's not saying Peter's the rock. He's not the Pope of the Catholic Church. It means it's on the rock of revelation of this truth. Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen, 
God is always going to build his church. It doesn't matter what the government does. It doesn't matter what they try and do or legislate or ban. Listen to me. Jesus is going to build his church. It doesn't matter what laws they try and implement or bring in. But that is why our relationships with one another are imperative. Because it's our relationships that is the witness to the world. I'm not sure your reference points when you got saved, but when I got saved, what so impacted me was the people in the church and how they got along with each other. People of different ages, people of different backgrounds, people of different cultures, and they were all together in relationship, the older people, the younger people, uh, the different accents, the different languages, and they all connected together, and that brings an impact on a person's life. Uh, and so that's why when we meet together and worship and fellowship, uh, it is the most powerful statement to the unsaved. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples, when they see the love you have for each other. Let me ask you a very poignant question this morning. Do people evidence, do they see the evidence in your life that you love the other Christians? Because I'm sorry to tell you, I see too many Christians who claim they're Christians and I don't see evidence that they love people. I don't see in their life evidence that they love the other disciples. In fact, what I often see is Christians who sow division. And yet Jesus said, if you and I are going to boast we're a disciple, there has to be the love that we hold for each other and other people can see that. This is why God determined these as the greatest commandments. Matthew 22, 37 to 39, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, this is what our church must be known for. Friendship and unity. That when people visit, when people drop by, when people get to know others from our congregation, they can see there's a unity. They can see that there's a, there's a bond, there's a care for one another, that there's a sincerity about a, a genuineness, a, about the care and the perspective that they hold for one another. And this is why, listen, that's when churches grow. When there's a unity, when there's a bond of relationship, and that is also why if a church is in a decline, there's a reason for it. Sometimes I look at church and say, well, I just don't really know what's going on. Well, I can tell you sometimes what's going on. There's a breakdown of relationship. There's not the unity. There's not the evidence of love that the disciples have for one another. Because where you will find that evidence of that love for one another, there will be healthy, it'll be a healthy body and healthy bodies are fruitful. The health, healthy bodies produce babies. In other words, people get saved. In verse 47, this is what our text is teaching us. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And I want to tell you that God would not have done that if they were disunited. I'm absolutely convinced. Why would God entrust a spiritual baby to a place where it's probably going to be destroyed? I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but that would just be my logical conclusion. I think that God wants to entrust spiritual babies where there's a healthy parent, where there's a spiritual parent, a spiritual housing, where the child is going to have every chance to make it, where the child can be kept healthy, where the child can grow, where the child can be nurtured. And this is why you and I have to understand the importance of fellowship and what it produces and the sense of unity and the love and the bond that's produced as a consequence because that is then now a place where God is able to entrust fruit to. One writer says this, he says, the people who are succeeding with creating the greatest results are people who are high on emotional intelligence, personal insights, and who dares to be as authentic as possible. 
Do you know something? You and I need to dare to be as authentic as possible, to be real, to be normal, to be open, because that's what people respond to. That's when people begin to realize, you know what? If you're like that, in fact, and if you've got those problems, there's a chance I can make it as well. What people find very difficult is when they think the standard's so high that they could never attain that. And to be honest, for years, I wasn't, didn't become a Christian I was 27 years old. And when I did, for all those years I'd watch Christians, I always liked them and I kind of respected them. But in my academic mind, I thought I could never be one because I knew how bad I was. I respected the way they lived, but I thought I could never do that. My drinking, my swearing, my, my disgusting behavior, my thieving, my, my attitudes, my... You, listen, I, I'd be here all day giving you things wrong with me. And I said, I couldn't be a Christian. And that's why you and I need to be transparent. Because there is a direct correlation between unified friendship and growth in a church. And God brings growth where there's unity. I want to finish with one verse again. It's Psalm 133, or I've read part of that, but I want to read the part of this as I conclude. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then it says towards the end, For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Not just offered the blessing, not just said, hey, guess what, if you want this, it's yours. He commanded the blessing. You know when God commands something, it happens. When God tells something it's going to happen, it happens. He spoke the worlds into existence. The Bible says in Genesis, he spoke and the earth was created. He spoke and the firmament came into being. He spoke and there were oceans. He spoke and he divided day and night. He commanded it. And here is his promise in his word. He says that when he can find a people who can dwell together in unity, there the Lord commanded the blessing. That is why you and I must continue to contend for fellowship to be a discipline in our lives. It's where friendships are formed. It's where unity is built. And it is ultimately what will help and contribute and cause the building of the church. Let's pray today. Can we bow our heads just for a moment, everybody? I just want you to close your eyes wherever you're sitting. If you just be still and just close your eyes. Because I want you to think about just a few sentences that I'm going to make. The first one is you are going to die. It might be of old age. It might be from COVID-19 might be from a car accident, might be from pneumonia. But you and I are going to die. It's inevitable. Second sentence I want to say is where will you go when you die? People say, oh, I'm just going to go into the ground. Oh, I'm just going to... That's not true. My friend, you are eternal. You are a spirit man. That's why you can remember perhaps when you were a little girl, when you were five or six or seven, and you were the same person then that you are now. The only thing that's changed is your body. It got taller, it got bigger, it got fatter, it got thinner, it got older, it got balder. Your body changed. The Bible calls it a tent because that's what you live in. But who you are has been the same from when you were born will be the same when you die and you will go into eternity. The third and final sentence that I want to make is in eternity, you will go to only two addresses, either heaven or you will go to hell. And hell is a place of judgment for sin where we will pay the price for all the wrongs that we've done. Unless... Jesus Christ becomes our Lord and our Saviour. And then, when we die, we go to heaven. And what's extraordinary is you don't have to do anything at all yourself to go to heaven. It's already been done. 
Jesus paid the price for us. That's why he died. That's what Christmas is really all about. It was the birth of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God's gift to the world. But he was only born because he was to die. And that's what he did. At 30-something years of age, they hung Jesus on a cross and killed him. But when he was killed, he was paying the price for me and for you because of what we've done. See, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is trust in that. Put your faith in Jesus. And you can be forgiven of your sin. And then you have guarantee that when you die, you will go to heaven. See, that's all a Christian is. That's all they are. A Christian is someone who has received the gift that God has offered them, the gift of salvation. And that's why the whole world pauses at Christmas time. And we know that Father Christmas and turkeys and all kinds of crazy things, puddings and shopping and stuff, it kind of tries to take center stage, but it never works. Christmas is about the birth of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. And I want to ask you, my friend, are you going to have everlasting life? Are you going to heaven? Because all you have to do is make Jesus your saviour and you have that guarantee. It's so simple. And you're here today and you say, you know, I want that gift for myself. I want the peace that that promises. I I want the guilt taken away. I want to be forgiven. And I I want Jesus to be my saviour. Would you lift up your hand if you want that? Say, that's me. Lift up your hand. Say, that's me. I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. I need to get my heart right. I need to get my heart right. Lift your hand if you need to do that. You can feel God's love. Listen, friend, it's, it, what I'm doing right now, someone did to me, 1987. And I remember lifting up my hand and responding. And I tell you, when I prayed a prayer, my drug addiction was taken away in one prayer. Within weeks, I'd stopped smoking tobacco. And within weeks of that, I stopped drinking beer. And never gone back to those things in all these years. Because it's powerful. It's supernatural. Jesus Christ is alive. He's real. Easter is about his death, but it's also about his resurrection. He rose again from the dead. And there is power in Jesus Christ to set you free from anything at all. You want that, lift your hand quickly, lift it up. Or you're a backslider, you want to recommit, lift it up quickly because I'm going to move on to other things. You've had enough time to respond already and you know if you want that. But remember, indecision is a decision. If you don't respond, you're saying no to the gift. Say yes to the gift, say yes. Receive it for yourself and I want to tell you, you'll never be the same again. Say yes, that's me, I want Jesus. Lift your hand quickly if you want that today. All right, I want to change and move this morning and I want to open the altar very quickly that we could pray. And I want you to respond to the altar today, prioritizing fellowship. If you want to come...